So, um, pseudo aligners, what is it? Uh, it's uh, the difference between a liner and a pseudo aligner is that it doesn't actually find the right locations on the genome or on a transcript. It basically just matches uh, a read to a transcript. And then that's all the information that you're gonna get. So you're not gonna get the exact position on the, on the transcript, but basically just uh, that it belongs to one or one or many transcripts. And it does so by matching k-mares between the reads and the transcripts. Uh, and I'm gonna to try to, I'm gonna start off really slow. So k-mares are nucleotides of length k. And often the programs are in of length uh, 30 or 31 is the default for Cal Calisto. And uh, let's say you have a gene. And uh, now I'm just mentioning one of my favorite genes, OCT4. That one is 1,574 nucleotides long. And if you have a K-mer of length seven, that means that uh, you can, uh, if this is the entire long sequence uh, and you have this, uh, subsequence of that one, it will. This part will be divided into k mers of seven. Uh, so it will be one k mer, two, three, four, five, and the number of k mers that you get is basically this: uh, the length of the entire part minus the k mer length plus one. So you will. This is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, uh, and the k mer is seven. So then you will have five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, makes sense. Or I made, made it correct. So uh, then you uh, basically split up all these k-mers and you uh, uh, over read uh, that has a certain length. And then you can now start to compare the k-mers of your read to the k-mer of all the different genes that now have been also split up. And this is just a lookup table. So this goes really fast. So then for uh, K-mer, for the first K-mer, it finds that this one is found in, in OCT4 and OCT2, but not in the other ones. The second one is found in OCT4 and OCT2, but not in the other ones. And it goes on and it looks and it looks. And it, at the end, it just summarizes all the K-mers. Where did we find the most K-mers? And as you can see, it found most of the K-mers in OCT4 and therefore it will assign the read one to OCT4 because that was the only one that had the highest number. So it would be one. And then uh, of course, so read one comes from sample one and then you would have one extra. And then it just do that for all the reads. So the second read, it uh, does the same thing. Uh, but in this case, it can't actually differentiate between these two genes. So then it will assign the transcript to both of these genes. So there will be a plus one for two of those. And then it just do that for all of them. Okay. So what is the problem? This still takes some time. And this is a real time, real example from uh, the program Callisto. And this is the human transcriptome, which has 173,259 transcripts in it. Uh, and the number of k-mers is 104, approximately 104 million k-mers. Uh, and then you have millions of reads and each read will have approximately 100 k-mers. So you can imagine there's a lot of comparisons going on here. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, it's not so not so fast. So then, of course, it does some tricks to to avoid this issue, uh, and it does it by building debris graphs of the k-mers, and then just identifying the important positions to separate these paths. And then they are using some statistics to assign the reads to a transcript. So. I'm gonna go really slow on this uh, and I'm gonna talk about first about the ring graph and how you how those are built up. And I'm gonna do it by giving some examples of some genes. So this is the red gene. 
Uh, and here you see the exons, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this one has seven exons. And here you can see that this gene has two different isoforms that are being transcribed. So you either it has skips the uh, exon two here, uh, or it skips exon one. And then it goes on. So if it skipped the second one, it also skips the six, sixth one. And if it skipped the first one, it will also skip the seventh one. So we will have two different isoforms with where the ones in the middle are the same, but different on the ends. And if you build that as a graph, that is going to be one and two, three, four, five, seven and six. So it will be look, the graph will be looking like this. Blue gene is, has the same part here, but they have two different isoforms with two different first exons. And that one is going to look like this. So this is going to be one, two, three, four, five. And then we have the green gene, which is the most compli complicated one. It has uh, eight exons and it has some skipping at the end here. So uh, one of the transcripts is going to uh, be one, two, three, four, five. One of them is going to be one, two, three, four, six, eight. And one of them is going to be one, two, three, four, six, seven. And those are the ones described here. And if you do that as a graph, you can have one, two, three, four. This is five. Here is six. Here is seven. And here is eight. So that should be an eight there. OK. Or can, I, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so you use these pseudo aligners when it's for the novo transcriptome assembly, or do you still have a reference here? Uh, so this is still for a reference. So okay. you need to have a transcriptome reference. But, but what you can do is, of course, that you can use your de novo assembled transcriptome as a reference uh, when you run these aligners. The only thing you have to, and it actually does a quite good job, you have to do some kind of uh, filtering of your transcriptome assembly before you start using it. So often when you do transcriptome assembly, you get lots of transcripts that, yeah, or you get, it's, it gets very, you get all the different isoforms and also a lot of you know, not correct assemblies. But after that, you can definitely uh, use that as a starting point for doing quantification. And then this is a really good method to do this uh, pseudo aligners. Okay, so you have three genes, but you also have to, uh, uh, of course, there will be some k that are the same for the different genes. So here you have some examples. You have one example here where you have an overlap between the green gene and the blue gene. You have one here where you have an overlap between all the three genes. And here you have two examples of where there's an overlap between the red gene and the green gene. So a more, beautiful debris graph of, of uh, this could be represented like this. Uh, so here you have the blue gene, the green gene, here you have the first overlap, the one they have all in common, and here you have the other two. So is there anyone who recognizes this kind of... Uh... Yes, it's Stockholm to Nirvana line. Exactly. So now we're getting to the game. The subway, Stockholm subway Debrain graph with the three lines, the blue, the red, and the green one. And uh, this is how it would be looking as a Debrain graph. And you can see that there is actually a transcript for every, every line. So for example, the T10 line is going to be in FASTA format, T10 transport or transcript, it's the blue line. And you can see it starts with Gulsta, comma, Tensta, comma, Finkeby, comma, and so on. And it goes all the way to Kungstagården. So you can basically, the, the sequence of this one is basically just the names of all the different stops. So 
what happens now uh, is that we now want to know uh, like how many people are traveling on the different lines. And the way we are going to do that is that we are going to do uh, sampling of the people going. And basically what the, the information that we're getting is that we're getting one transport sequence per person. It's just that this sequence is so long, so we can only take up one small parts of it. So, but there's one fragment per, per travel and it's approximately 100 characters. And this is done by hand. So uh, someone has to actually write off these characters and put it on post-it notes. And this is quite boring work. So uh, the union has only uh, agreed to write up the first 25 characters of the sequence. And they are being put on post-it notes and that's the information that we are getting. And uh, they are also agreeing only to do 25,000. And if you want to look at the, how the how this is done, so this is basically the information of the travel, and then it's being fragmented, so we only get 100 characters, and then you get to this uninspiring workplace where they are, are writing down the 25 first uh, characters of that one, and then delivers these 25,000 post-it notes per day for you to work. And this is one example of this post-it note. That's Insta, comma, Rinkeby, comma, Risne, comma, Dubo. There's one more catch here before we start the game. And that is actually that you can only remember 10 characters at a time. So you can actually look at the entire information here, but you can only look at a K mirror of 10. So if you look at the post it one, came first, K mirror. It's going to be an insta rinke, and then it's going to be sta rinke, and so on, so on, until the last one, which is going to be SSNI dubo. So now, by using uh, your annotation, I want you to help me to identify where this, uh, this person is traveling in, on what line, and uh, I want you to sort of mark it on the, on the, basically by saying that, okay, I think it's here by uh, finding this place in the, in the map. So you're going to should highlight that one. And you should also highlight where do you want the points to go on this one down here. So please go ahead and find where is this first post-it note located on the map. Yeah. Okay, it seems like everyone is quite, yeah, good. Oh, look, there's arrows. That's actually uh, nice. So I think if everyone can do arrows with the, uh, that's kind of nice. So do you know how to do arrows? It's in the, it's in the stamp, there's an arrow. Okay, I think we're all good. So everyone has found a place and we only needed one. There were 16, but we only needed one. Why are you all so sure that it's already at the first one, that this is the right, right place? Because it's a small underground network. Yes, that's good. <laughs> That's one thing. So it's a really small one. So there's so not that many options. Uh, but it's also true in uh, real life sequencing. So, so what happens is that if you're looking at the 30 mirror of a nucleotide, this often just occurs once in a genome. So that basically means that if you find the location of the first k mirror this is in most cases sufficient to locate where the read is going. You don't have to look any further. You're basically at the right location. 
most program uses two. So it takes the first one and the last one. And if they are in, on the same transcript, then it will just say, okay, this is the place. So instead of looking up all the different cameras, it just has to look up two. So this is one of the things that uh, the program has assigned to make it much faster. It, you don't have to actually go through all the different cameras. So that's the first take home message of uh, this one. So now you can please remove your, uh, all the, can someone do that for me? Or should I, I can do it. I clear all the drawings. Okay, so now we're at the second one. Oh, look. So everyone are sort of seeing where the second post-it note is. And again, Everyone knows it should be T14 and there should be one added there. And there's like no ambiguity here. So again, it's a super fast. We're having one lookup where we can all already decide. We don't have to look at all of them. Okay, so now you can stop. Uh, so let's look at the next one. This is the third one. Now it says TS and Fallen. Or T-Centrale. So where should you put this one? Yeah, so Jennifer is basically saying this one should go all over the place. But do you think we can actually separate it a bit more? I think so. So let's see what happens if we look at the second camera. Well, it's actually not so much extra information. What if we look at the third one? Not so much. So I'm going to clear this now. Uh, so what happens if we look at the fourth one? Yeah, exactly. So now, actually, when we get to the fourth K here, we can start to distinguish between the red line and the blue line because here comes the K and that's in Kungsteigorden. It can't be G, would it be G? It would be Gamma Song. But there were actually some of these posts that were totally uninteresting because if you know this one, you know that this next, next two are going to be N and a comma. And that information is also used in, in these pseudo aligning programs that instead of looking at all the camera, it's basically in the, in the uh, debris graph identifies where is the next important information. And, and they basically call them as packages. So for example, this will be one package. And if you find one camera here, it will just ignore and it will jump all the way down here to see like, Next one. So it would skip all the cameras in between. So instead of actually having to look at all the cameras in this graph, it can identify this is one package, this is one package, this is one package, this is one package, and this is one package. So basically you can see that it's it shrinks the information to be much, much smaller, and there you don't have to make that many stops. So so this is uh, the next thing that uh, a pseudo aligner does to speed up the process. Okay. So now we have the next one. It has started with the same thing, TS and Fala, but now we know you don't have to look at the second and the third. So basically it jumps directly to the fourth one. And now it's a G. Okay, and now it sort of sees that now it goes on Gamla Stan, Slus, and that's all the same as it's in the same package. So it looks at the last k that we have, which is the last on SL. So now, yeah, exactly. So now you sort of highlighted everything that it can't decide if it's the green line or the red line. So it has to give scores to all of them. So it will give a score to, to all of these ones. Great. Yeah. So 
you kind of reported this back that it's actually quite hard to uh, uh, distinguish between some of the lines in some parts. So uh, you redid the how you should do this. So instead of uh, writing 25 characters in a row, you agreed that you should do 10 characters at the end and at the, at the start of the, this one. So this is sort of the idea of paired and reads, right? Where you are in the fragment, you're getting information from the initial part of it and the last part. And now when they redo this post-it four, they get T-centrale and the end is Globen. So where, which one is it now then? If the start of this, yeah. So which one should get the, yeah, exactly. So this is actually the advantage of uh, paired and reads. Uh, that you actually, you, for, for a fragment, you're getting information about a long, much longer distance. And when you wanna start separating different types of uh, isoforms, so you wanna do things like that, then this uh, jump between the different parts of the same fragment is, is very helpful for including information. Uh, and another good thing is that, uh, but I sort of forgot to mention is that the fragments are of approximately a hundred characters. So you can also sort of start counting uh, that, yeah, okay, I find Tessentalen and I find something here. Uh, and then the, the number of characters in between should be approximately a hundred characters. And then uh, that one also makes sense. And this is some information that, uh, that that Callisto also is using for uh, deciding which of the transcripts to assign it to, because sometimes, uh, and I'm gonna give you one last example before we wrap this up. So this is the last example. Where should this one go? Yeah, okay. Does everyone agree that you should all put it on both the T18 and the blue and the green line? Or is it, is it anyone who has a other opinion? Does anyone dare? I mean, you're free to speak if you want to. So what was the length of the sequence? approximately a hundred hundred characters so then it would have to be the green because there are enough yeah uh, things between <laughs> exactly so that's the that's the information that is also being used by uh callisto when you're using paired and reads that it can actually use that information what is the distance between the between the two uh, k mirrors and then take that into account. So in this case, the length of the fragment was a hundred characters and then now you have 10 on each side. So that means that there should be approximately 80 characters in between these two. And here it's only 10 and I, I don't have the energy to count this, but I think it's, it's at least it's much closer to one to 80 than, than this one. So then it will actually assign it to only this one. So it will only assign it to the green line. So all these things that I mentioned now are things that are taken into account to the Callisto program that sort of to make it super fast by looking at all these different packages and then using the k mirrors to identify where they are and, and if they are paired and reads to uh, distinguish and separate between different isoforms or different genes depending on the distance between these two. Yeah, so this is uh, real, again, more information from uh, 
So when Callisto builds the index, it takes the k-mere length of 31. And why do you take 31? So there is some, uh, some reasoning behind this. Uh, and uh, the first one is that when they're doing genome assemblies, which is also or transcriptome assemblies with, uh, uh, with K-mers and this debris graph, it has been shown that this is a quite good length for eukaryotes. And correct me if I'm wrong, Lucille, but that's my understanding. And, and uh, there's also some, so you want it long enough so that you can easily separate between uh, uh, different locations in the transcriptome or the genome. But you don't want it too long because there's going to be errors in the, in the sequencing machine. So you will have errors in your reads and you will also maybe have uh, variants. So I mean, the human genome is, uh, is a, uh, has one sequence which is sort of the average of the entire human population, but we all have variants within our own genome, of course, or our own transcriptome. So we're, so that means that, and if there are any of those ones are being picked up, and now when we start comparing the K-mers, we will not have the same exact same sequence. So therefore it's not good to have it too long because now then you're in a chance that you will have a sequencing error or a variation in your sequence compared to the reference, uh, which makes that the camera won't stick. And this has been sort of a trade-off between these two things. Uh, and that's why it's 31. Okay, so the number of targets I told you before, and the number of K-mirs. And here is actually the number of, so instead of actually looking up 104 million locations, it had, had identified that it's only 700,000 classes that it has to distinguish between. So if it finds one of these classes, that's enough to actually put it into one, one place. This one is running in paired and mode. And when you do that, you will also get this uh, distribution or the, uh, the, you will get the distribution of the insert size or the fragment size, which it will use. And then it will add this. And then basically now here it processed uh, 92 million reads and uh, 82 of those ones. So basically, so 90% of all the reads or even more were mapped to correct location. Uh, so, um, so this is how Callista works. And just uh, if you read their paper, they're saying that for the majority of the reads, so even though you have paired and reads, uh, you know, long, Callisto ends up performing a hash lookup. So basically looking for these k-mers where they're located, for only two, two k-mers. So basically most of the reads that you're providing them, they only have to look for two k-mers and where they are, and then it will put it, put it at the correct location. And that's why it's so fast, it's sort of like, uh, uh, yeah, it's super impressive when you when you work with it that it just uh, and it's also very light so you could use it on on a computer and I think you could use it on a on a phone I mean you don't need any memory really and you don't need uh, or you don't need much memory uh, and you don't need a great computer either so you could do this with your 10 year old computer almost. So that's, I think it's really cool. Okay. So uh, that's all I have to say about pseudoliners. So for the afternoon, uh, we are going to do, uh, or not afternoon, but as a exercise for trying this out, you are going to use uh, the transcriptome of the mouse instead of the human genome as a starting reference. And you will have the reads again uh, between the two different time points. So the same reads uh, that you used before. Uh, and then you're going to use Callisto to actually pseudo align these reads to the transcriptome. And you will instead now uh, get all the different transcripts per gene. So you will get multiple 
uh, counts per gene like this. Uh, so uh, now uh, people have been looking at this and uh, they have the, one of the conclusions that has been made after this program came out is that you can, by using some tricks, convert a transcripts read to gene level reads. And there's a program in R that can do this. Uh, and uh, there's a paper out where they're sort of describing uh, how, how they do this and uh, analyze what are the results of actually doing this stuff. Uh, and uh, what they did was that they uh, generated uh, reads uh, so they knew uh, from which transcript they came from and from which gene they came from. Uh, and then they uh, mapped them to the reference uh, uh, using, uh, in this case, salmon, which is another pseudo liner, which we are not going to use. And then they looked how, how good was the correlation in terms of uh, using uh, the mapped transcript, if you compared. If you converted, using their method, converted that uh, transcript information to gene information and compared to the expression levels. And then they mapped the reads uh, to the genome uh, like you've done before, use feature count to uh, get the quantification of the genes and then looked at the compared expression of these genes uh, and using feature counts. And, and the take home message is that you get better correlation between the real expression of genes than uh, when using first one of these pseudo liners and then using their program to convert it to gene levels, then if you would do uh, the traditional ways of doing alignment and then uh, feature count with the annotation and the gene. I mean, both of them are doing a really good job. So it's not a big difference. So, and there are, and uh, if you remember the first day or second day when I was talking about quantification, there were external persons who did this as well and and they were also saying that they were these two methods are performing equally well so basically you can decide after you tried out this pseudo line you can decide for yourself which of the two methods do i want to use but i still think uh, that there is a strong support for that uh, the gene levels are much more uh, reliable and robust than the transcript levels. Uh, and uh, the, yeah, so the first part of the summary of this, uh, this uh, paper is that uh, they say that in this article, we have contrasted transcript and gene resolution analysis in terms of both abundance, estimation, and statistical inference and illustrated that gene level results are often more accurate, powerful, and interpretable than transcript level results. And I agree with them. So I, I, I think that if you don't really know why you wanna look at transcripts, I think you should convert it to genes. So that's what you will also be doing in the exercise. You will use this program TX import to take your transcripts uh, table and convert it into a gene table. And then uh, once you have that as a gene table uh, in this program, uh, because there are some things to uh, make sure that the counts are uh, represented well in the DSEC or HR, they have uh, also functions for making this gene table that is produced. Uh, so it's uh, functional and you can work it on DSEC. And once you get here to DSEC, it's basically go jumping right back into uh, Roy's lecture about DSEC for DSEC uh, analysis and how you do it. So, uh, so uh, you have, from here, you have done lectures before on how to do it. But, and you don't have to do that today. I'm basically just saying that Today, I'm giving you one more tool to go from uh, uh, mapping reads to, to basically start with these. Uh, that, 
is all I have to say for now.